I think can we invite all the students outside to actually come in and just just fill in all the
How funny. Assalamualaikum. Ah uh, diminta semua bersabar sikit ya. Kita masih menunggu kedatangan VIP VIP kita. Jangan keluar dulu tau. I think uh, for the students, kalau ada kawan-kawan yang sedang kat luar, you can still invite them to come and uh, if they don't mind, boleh je duduk dekat tangga. It be nice juga. Ya. Yeah? Uh, just just share them with your friends.
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Ladies and gentlemen, good morning Before we start, we would like to give some housekeeping announcements To ensure the smoothness of our event today Please ensure that your phone is in silent mode Or turned off during the event We would like to request all guests to stand upon the arrival of our honoured guest The event will commence shortly Therefore, your cooperation is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Okay. 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 
gitu Announcing the arrival of Professor Dr. Dr. Mizan Hitam, Assistant Vice Chancellor, Institute of Leadership and Development, accompanied by Professor Dr. Nazrun Shuait, Deputy Dean for Student Affairs, Faculty of Medicine, and the management team of University Technology Mara UITM, Faculty of Medicine, and Hospital Asultan Abdullah UITM. of esteemed professors of Faculty of Medicine UITM and the Honorable Professor Dr. Sazli Shahlan Kasim to the auditorium. Ladies and gentlemen, we will proceed with Malaysia's national anthem, Negaraku, and the Wawasan and Setia Warga UITM.
may be seated. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning. A very warm welcome to each and every one of you. Professor Dato Dr. Mizan Hitam, Assistant Vice Chancellor of the Institute of Leadership and Development, Professor Dr. Sazri Kasim, Director of the Hospital Al Sultan Abdullah, UITM, Professor Dr. Ahmad Nazrun Shuid, Deputy Dean for Student Affairs, Faculty of Medicine, UITM, Professor Dato Dr. Ahmad Zubaidi bin Abdul Latif, Director of Hospital Pengajar, University Sultan Zainal Abidin, Professor Dr. Muhammad Zulkifli Abu Bakar, Deputy Director in Clinical, Pusat Perubatan, University Malaya. The management teams from the Faculty of Medicine and Hospital Al Sultan Abdullah, esteemed professors from the Faculty of Medicine, beloved family of Prof. Sazlis, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the professorial lecture by our honorable professor, Dr. Sazli Shahlan Kasim, entitled Heart of the Matter Dealing with Cardiac Death. Praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've been graced by the chance to gather to together today in this momentous ceremony. Before we move on, let, a be, let us begin with the recitation of Doa, which will be led by Ustaz Adam Zakaria, the head of spirituality of Hospital Al Sultan Abdullah. Please welcome Ustaz. Al Fatiha. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه حمدا يوافي نعمه ويكافئ مزيده يا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Oh Allah, you are the one who possesses all praise. You are the one deserving of all praise. You are the one deserving of all gratitude. You are the one who holds all authority. In your hand is all goodness. To you written all affairs. Oh Allah, please forgive our sins and our parents' sins. Have mercy upon them as they brought me up when we were young. Allahumma ya rahimu ya wadud. يا ذا العرش المجيد يا فعال لما يريد. On this blessed day, in conjunction with the professorial lecture by Professor Dr. Chazli Shahlan Kasim, we beseech thee and grateful towards you in favour of all the infinite blessing to us, to live in safe and prosperous life. We seek your blessing for a fluency progress of this program, from the beginning till the end. We also seek protection from you against anything that may blemish or harm our gathering and from anything that distracts us from obeying you. To you, we entrust all our affairs and to you, we surrender, placing our hopes in you. May all our efforts and deeds throughout our lives be counted as righteous and virtuous so that they may serve as provisions when we stand before you on the day of resurrection. Allahumma ja'al jam'ana haza jam'an marhuma wa tafarruqna min ba'dihi tafarruqan ma'asuma wa la taj'al fina wa la ma'ana shaqiyan wa la maqrudan wa la mahruma Rabbana alayka tawakkalna wa ilayka anabna wa ilayka al-masir Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta al-sami'un alim wa tub alayna innaka anta al-tawwab al-rahim ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار 
Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala sayyidina Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Thank you Ustaz for the recitation of doa The middle layer lies the myocardium The blood flows in the coronary artery From Cork Island to UITM Now an eminent cardiologist in the country it is our pleasure to host the professorial lecture today. Myself and Faiza are both juniors at the same medical school, University College Cork, where Professor Sazli has graduated from. Prof. Sazli has been an inspiration to the juniors and colleagues throughout his students' days and career life. He has shown us the importance of dreaming big, thinking outside of the box, work hard, but at the same time to have fun, which is not the easiest thing to do. And most importantly, to stay compassionate and also humble. Thank you very much, Prof. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we would like to invite the Honorable Professor Dr. Nazrun Shuaid, Deputy Dean for Student Affairs, Faculty of Medicine, UITM, to give his speech and, and introduce our Honorable Speaker. Please welcome, Professor. Honourable Professor Dato Dr Mizan Hitam, Assistant Vice Chancellor of the Institute of Leadership and Development, Professor Dr Sazli Shahlan Kasim, Director of the Hospital Asutan Abdullah UITM, Prof Dato Dr Ahmad Zabidi Zubaidi bin Abdul Latif, Director of Hospital Pengajar University Sultan Zainal Abidin. Prof. Dr. Muhammad Zulkifli Abu Bakar, Deputy Director Clinical Pusat Perubatan University Malaya, the management teams from the Faculty of Medicine and Hospital Asutan Abdullah, esteemed professors of the Faculty of Medicine, and uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan salam sejahtera. Pertama kali saya ingin menyampaikan salam daripada Dekan Fakulti Perubatan, Prof. Madia Dr. Fazah. Beliau sedang mengikuti konferen di Singapura dan saya amat besar hati kerana diberi uh, peluang untuk uh, memberi ucapan bagi pihak Dekan. Uh, izinkan saya menyampaikan ucapan dalam bahasa Inggeris. Ladies and gentlemen, today we have the distinct pleasure of coming together to celebrate a true luminary in the field of cardiology. We are here to honor the remarkable achievements and expertise of Professor Dr. Sazli Shahlan Kasim, whose contributions have made an enduring impression on the field of medicine. Prof. Sazli journey in the realm of cardiology symbolizes the culmination of years of unwavering dedication, rigorous research, and selfless teaching. Today's professional lecture represents the pinnacle of an academic career, the culmination of countless hours spent delving into the intricacies of specific area of study. Let us be inspired by the remarkable journey of Professor Sazli. He has etched his name in the annals of the medical world through his exceptional expertise and unwavering leadership. Professor Sazli was born on the 5th of March, 1977, in Hospital Kuala Lumpur. He's married to Dr. Mas Liana Hussein and is blessed with five children. 
For secondary school, he attended St. John's Institution in Kuala Lumpur and Mara Junior Science College, MRSM, in Taiping, before pursuing Irish Living Certificate. His medical journey began with the pursuit of an MBBCH degree, a medical degree, at the esteemed University College of Cork, National University of Ireland, in 2001. His relentless pursuit of knowledge led him to specialize in internal medicine and cardiology, culminating in the prestigious Certificate of Satisfactory Completion of Specialist Training, CSCST, from the Irish College of Higher Medical Training in 2011. In 2012, he returned to Malaysia, where he assumed the role of an Associate Professor of Medicine at the Faculty of Medicine, UITM. Ladies and gentlemen, since 2016, Professor Sazli has been at the helm spearheading the construction operation of University Technology Maras Teaching Hospital in the picturesque locale of Puncha Alam Selangor, now called Hospital Asutan Abdullah, or Hasa. It is a testament to his vision and dedication shaping a beacon of healthcare excellence. In his role as the director of Hospital Asutan Abdullah, University Technology Mara, Professor Sazli shoulders the noble responsibility of overseeing its operations, ensuring the delivery of top-notch care to our cherished patients. He is an active contributor to the hospital's growth and expansion plans, with an unwavering focus on elevating its medical and technological prowess, envisioning a future marked by innovation and excellence. Throughout his distinguished career, Professor Dr. Sazali has demonstrated an unparalleled commitment to advancing our understanding of cardiac health. He has not been contented with the status quo, but has constantly pushed the boundary of knowledge, pioneering innovative approaches to prevent, diagnose, and treat heart-related conditions. His visionary work was not only had a profound impact on our institution, but has radiated outward, influencing the broader medical community. His extensive affiliations include active memberships with esteemed institutions like the College of Physicians Malaysia, National Heart Association Malaysia, Asia Pacific Society of Cardiology, European Society of Cardiology, Irish Cardiac Society, and European Atherosclerosis Society. Currently, he holds a council membership with the National Heart Association Malaysia, and he proudly bears the title of a Fellow of the Royal College of Physicians in Ireland and the European Society of Cardiology. Today, let us draw inspiration from the remarkable journey of Professor Dr. Sazli. We celebrate not just a professor, but a visionary whose dedication to advancing healthcare knowledge and excellence has left an indelible mark on the medical world. It is a day to look forward with hope and anticipation, as we know that the impact of his work will continue to resonate far into the future. On behalf of the Faculty of Medicine at University Technology Mara, it is my privilege to extend heartfelt congratulations to Professor Dr. Sazli Shahlan Kasim for, his, for reaching this significant milestone in his career. This milestone is not just a testament to his personal achievements, but it also symbolizes his unwavering commitment to the betterment of humanity through the pursuit of medical knowledge and excellence. Once again, congratulations, Prof. Dr. Sazali Shahlan Kasim. And with that, thank you. Wabilahi Taufiq wal Hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Professor Nazrun. Ladies and gentlemen,
ladies and gentlemen, let's continue our ceremony today with the montage of the life story of our beloved Professor Dr. Sazli. Interesting montage. Ladies and gentlemen, treatment of ACS includes better blockers, ST elevation shown on ECG strips. A great physician with astounding researchers, a passionate teacher with great leaderships. We have reached the pinnacle of our event today. We would like to invite the Honorable Professor Dr. Sazli Shahlan Kasim. Uh, to deliver his professorial lecture entitled Heart of the Matter Dealing with Cardiac Death. Please welcome, Prof. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Panjang pula lagu tu. Um, yang saya hormati Prof. Datuk Dr. Mizan Hitam selaku penolong Naib Chancellor daripada Institute of Leadership and Development UITM. Kalau saya nak sebut satu-satu ni memang panjang. Jadi saya sangat bersyukur dengan kehadiran tetamu-tetamu kehormat rakan-rakan daripada Fakulti Perubatan, rakan-rakan daripada Hostel Al-Sultan Abdullah Keluarga saya yang saya sayangi dan juga teman-teman dan juga kenalan-kenalan daripada sekolah, daripada universiti uh, sehingga sekarang. Selamat datang ke Hospital Al-Sultan Abdullah UITM. <tuk> saya dah terbiasa dengan cakap macam tu, jadi kita mulakan begitu. Pertama sekali, uh, syukur kehadiran ilahi. Uh, kerana sama-sama kita dapat berkumpul pada hari ini Saya sangat bertuah dan sangat bersyukur Dengan segala rezeki yang telah diterima InsyaAllah Pada pagi ini um, Saya ingin berkongsi dengan rakan-rakan semua Tuan-tuan dan puan-puan Sedikit sebanyak pengalaman Dan juga cabaran Yang saya sebagai seorang insan Manusia uh, Pelajar anak, pensyarah, cikgu, ayah, hadapi selama uh, kehidupan saya yang agak pendek ni sebenarnya. Baru lagi, baru nak start orang kata. Tapi sebelum saya lupa, izinkan saya mengucapkan ribuan terima kasih kepada jawatan kuasa penganjur, jawatan kuasa yang menjadikan hari ini uh, seperti ini kerana mereka telah bertungkul lumus sehingga ke malam hari semalam untuk memastikan uh, floor plan, layout, proses dan sebagainya berjalan lancar. Terima kasih. <coughs> Okey. Izinkan saya berbahasa Inggeris dan berbahasa Malaysia semasa 
memberi syarahan sarjana ini. Heart of the matter dealing with cardiac death. Sebelum kita bermula, kita kena faham sebenarnya entiti yang berada di hadapan anda ini datangnya dari mana. Sebab seperti Prof. Nasrun kata, anak lima, ada orang kat sebelah saya cakap, lima? Okey lah, saya nak saja senam tapi dia tak bagi. <laughs> um, pada mulanya saya bersekolah di sekolah agama. Malangnya sekolah agama <laughs> St. John's Institution. Kenapa? <laughs> saya membesar di Taman Ibu Kota di Gobak. Dan pada masa itu, itu adalah antara sekolah yang terbaik. Ada history dia, Datuk Sri Najib, mantan Perdana Menteri kita pun pernah pergi situ dan adik-beradiknya dan rakan-rakannya. Jadi ia adalah salah satu sekolah yang bagus. Masih lagi salah satu sekolah yang terbaik di Kuala Lumpur dan di Malaysia pada masa, masa ini. Pelajar-pelajarnya sangat kreatif. Di St. John's, antara logo yang kami banggakan adalah burung helang. Eagle. Dan eagle ni fungsinya, dia akan terbang tinggi, dia akan pantau, dia akan nampak dengan matanya yang tajam. Bila dia lapar, dia terjun. Dia makan. Lepas itu dia pergilah hilang. Dia tak sibuk pun. Tapi orang nampak dia, dia terbang. It's such a symbolic representation of a person, of life, to be able to oversee in macro and micro manner. Itu eagle dia. Setelah itu, setelah SRP, SRP, uh, I did not do PMR, SRP. Belum that young. Uh, saya telah berhijrah ke Taiping. Satu bandar yang sangat kuat hujannya. Ramai senior-senior dan junior-junior saya daripada Taiping pun kat sini. Dr. Izzat, senior saya. Sebab dia tak boleh saya. Dr. Syafina, junior saya. <laughs> dan di Taiping, saya alami masalah yang lain daripada di St. John. Kalau di St. John, sekolah bandar. Jadi masyarakat dia berbeza. Habis sekolah, pergi lepak. Kisah ukur, clubbing dan sebagainya. <laughs> Hakikat. Saya budak baik. Rumah jauh. Di Taiping, rata-ratanya majoritinya adalah rakan-rakan daripada kalangan bumi putera. Dan waktu itu saya berkenalan dengan rakan-rakan cakap Kelantan, Kedah, Sabah, Sarawak dan sebagainya. Agak kekok untuk budak bandar. Tapi Alhamdulillah, mereka juga lah jugalah yang menjadi rakan dan sahabat rapat sehingga sekarang. Setelah di Taiping, kita belajar mengenai kehidupan. Um, Alhamdulillah, saya mendapat biasiswa tajaan Mara dan saya end up dekat Ireland. Cerita di Ireland ni pelik sikit. Masa tu baru umur 17 tahun. Uh, tu saya ba baru nak mendaftar dengan rakan saya Hisham Talib, Muhammad Syaril, Hud Azlan, semuanya ada di sini uh, untuk English course pada bulan 12, SPM hari bulan 11. Dan suatu hari mendaftar, telefon berbunyi dan saya diberi uh, berita uh, sebenarnya dapat beasiswa ke Ireland. Gembira sebab saya ingat saya ke London. London kotanya tinggi, megah, hebat, selalu dengar tengok dalam TV. Bila landing pesawat pada bulan 1 di Ireland, 5 hari bulan 1 di Ireland, pesawat pun turun, saya tengok keluar tingkap, hijau. Ada tumpuk-tumpuk putih, ingat awan. Rupanya kambing biri-biri. Apabila landing, saya tengok Hood, Hood bersama saya, kita ni kena tipu ke? <laughs> Lama duduk di situ, 18 tahun, um, setelah buat foundation je, Living Cert, ke degree, ke subspecialty training, Sehinggalah saya habis. Pengalaman selama 18 tahun di negara orang telah banyak mengajar. Negara orang. Betullah hujan emas di negara orang, hujan batu di negeri sendiri. Apabila saya pulang ke Malaysia pada tahun 2012, sekali saja rasa hujan batu pada tahun 2013. Hail kan? Uh, tapi sebenarnya apabila berada di negeri orang, kepuasan tu tak sampai. Walaupun dah bekerja lama. Yes. Anak saya setuju. Tidak. Okey, saya cepat sikit lah. <laughs> um, you always feel like a second class citizen, no matter what you do. And that's not nice. Because we feel, saya rasa, mempunyai banyak potential, tetapi tidak kesampaian. Di sana juga, uh, saya banyak melakukan aktiviti-aktiviti riadah yang seperti yang kita dapat lihat lah. Itu bukan six pack. Bukan six pack, percayalah. Itu adalah ilusi optik wetsuit semata-mata di gambar top right hand corner. Okay. 
Pulangnya di Malaysia, saya menyertai Fakulti Perubatan pada 2012 dan di situ saya mempelajari bagaimana menjadi pensyarah untuk mengajar, menjaga pesakit, melaksanakan fungsi sebagai doktor jantung setelah mendapat uh, kepakaran di Ireland. Uh, dan antara tugas saya adalah berjumpa pesakit, melakukan ujian-ujian seperti echo, ultrasound, echocardiogram, angiogram dan juga meletakkan saluran, uh, apa, membuka saluran-saluran sumbat, membentukkan nadi yang uh, perlahan, menguatkan jantung yang tak sihat. Ini dia fakulti perubatan. Kalau nak dilihat daripada gambar ni, di bilik ni lah saya ditemu bual oleh arwah Datuk Khalid Yusof pada hari Jumaat 21 Januari tahun 2012. Selama tiga jam. <laughs> Cerita dia panjang. Sebelum tu, seminggu sebelum tu saya telah pergi ke bangunan CTC di sini. Di sini. Dan di tingkat empat ni saya duduk dekat tingkap ni dengan uh, Dr. Zubin. Dr. Zubin ada sini? Cara maya aku dia di klinik dengan Dr. Zubin. Masa tu dia dalam training. Saya masuk ke dalam bilik bedah tu. Saya nampak Dr. Zubin tengah bedah. Bila saya masuk, saya cakap dekat ada dua uh, warga emas di sebelah kiri tu. Saya nak jumpa Dr. Zubin. Oh, dia dalam tengah operate. Okey, saya jumpa staff ni. Saya nak jumpa Dr. Zubin. Oh, dia kat dalam tengah operate. Okey. Saya tak perasan yang dua warga emas tu sebenarnya adalah arwah Datuk Khalid dan juga Pak Lah. <laughs> Malu sedikit lah ketika tu. Tu pasal saya kena tarbiah tiga jam di pejabat atas ni. Masya Allah. Lepas tu terus join UITM. UITM untung sebab saya sikit lagi nak masuk UKM. Tapi UKM lambat bagi interview. Alhamdulillah. Antara fungsi saya sebagai seorang pakar jantung adalah untuk menjaga pesakit jantung, obviously. Saya juga melakukan prosedur-prosedur jantung seperti membantu orang yang kena serangan sakit jantung, membuka saluran sumbat. Ini adalah senario kalau saya tak ada dekat Hospital Al-Sultan Abdullah ni, saya berada di Sungai Buloh, ha, macam inilah keadaan saya. Atau mungkin di tempat lain, tapi biasanya macam itulah. Bila kita memedah ha, saluran jantung. Saya harus berterima kasih kepada Datuk Dr. Amin, Profesor Datuk Amin. Kerana pada tahun 2015, saya kena sleep disk. Tak kelakar. Bila kita operate jantung macam ni, kita kena pakai baju besi untuk mengelakkan rat, uh, sinar X daripada mesin X-ray ni. Kalau tak pakai, show cancer punya. Baju besi itu 7 kilogram. 7 kilogram sayang. As heavy as you. Nah, apabila you operate selama 2-3 jam, kadang-kadang 4 jam, lama-lama, tulang belakang tu sakit. Saya pergi ke Datuk Amin, Datuk saya tak boleh operate lagi sakit belakang. Datuk kata, tak apa, you cuba try dengan benda lain. So, dia belikan saya satu alat ni namanya Zero Gravity. Gantung si apa pelindung sinaran X tu daripada ceiling, untuk memenangkan kita operate 4 jam. Memang dia tak sayang saya, dia nak saya mati awal. <laughs> Lanjutan daripada itu, saya juga ingin berterima kasih kepada Prof. Dr. Dr. Fauzi yang ada klinik pada pagi ini, tapi kita sempat jumpa pagi tadi. Kerana pada tahun 2016, dia telah bertanya kepada saya sama ada saya boleh menjadi pengarah di Hospital Asul Tabdullah, pengarah Hospital UITM. Saya cakap saya tak pandai, saya jaga jantung bolehlah. Tapi dia kata, you boleh. Tapi saya cakap saya kena belajar. Uh, you nak belajar kat mana? Dari dulu saya nak belajar kat London. Kena tipu pergi Ireland. So saya dapat pergi London. <laughs> London School of Economics. Di mana saya buat Master in Health Economics. Sort of like an MBA. Uh, dan banyak lagi modul. Dan Alhamdulillah faedahnya sangat uh, ketara. Ini adalah uh, hasil daripada anugerah dana kecemerlangan daripada UITM. Yang sponsor sebanyak 200,000. Ini 2020, masa graduation. Dan setelah itu menjadi pengarah hospital dan sekarang kita sibuk memberi balik kepada komuniti macam pada minggu lepas saya memberi syarahan kepada pelajar-pelajar tahun 4 dan tingkat 4 dan tingkat 5 di UIA untuk membantu kerja mereka. Okey. That is my story. That is my journey for my life. I can finish the professorial lecture like right here kalau semua orang setuju. <laughs> Tapi saya rasa saya sambunglah. <laughs> Okey. What is cardiac death? Apa itu kematian jantung? Kematian jantung ni ialah semua orang pasti mati. Itu memang syarat lah. Okay. Tapi kita selalu dengar orang mati mengejut dan kita selalu tanya itu disebabkan oleh jantung ke? Uh, anda semua perlu tahu mati mengejut tu boleh disebab, biasanya disebabkan oleh jantung tu berhenti. Kadang-kadang boleh disebabkan oleh pendarahan dalam otak. Kadang-kadang boleh disebabkan oleh saluran darah utama dalam badan terkoyak. Kadang-kadang boleh disebabkan oleh aortic aneurysm seperti yang telah berlaku kepada Arya saya. Masih hidup sekarang ni. Dia orang ada di rumah. Terlupa saya nak ucapkan Uh, hello kepada mereka. Um, tapi itu adalah punca-punca orang mati. Kematian daripada penyakit jantung ni banyak punca saja. Dan malangnya, 
Sadly, penyakit jantung ni masih menjadi pembunuh nombor satu di Malaysia dan di dunia for the past 20 years. Tak ada ubah pun. Before 20 years, penyakit berjangkit. TB, pneumonia, sepsis. Tapi for the past 20 years, memang urbanisation, modernisation telah berlaku dan kebanyakan kematian adalah disebabkan oleh penyakit jantung. Ya? Cuma pada tahun lepas sahaja, COVID berjaya memotong kematian daripada penyakit jantung. Kita tewas. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Seperti yang saya cakap, penyakit jantung tu kalau dia nak membunuh, kadang-kadang kita nampak orang tu ada serangan sakit jantung atau dia ada penyakit jantung, lemah jantung atau injap dia boncor dan penyakit tu menjadi penyakit kronik. Lama-lama jantung dia lemah dan dia tak dapat fungsi, organ-organ lain akan shut down dan dia pun akan menemui ajal. Ya. Tetapi ada juga segelintir orang yang tak sampai di situ. Tiba-tiba dijumpai mati. Sudden cardiac arrest. Tiba-tiba tak bangun dari tidur. Tiba-tiba lepas main bola, tengah duduk-duduk, tidur, pengsan dan tak bangun. Banyak juga berlaku. Dan ini namanya sudden cardiac arrest. Kebanyakan punca sudden cardiac arrest adalah disebabkan oleh penyakit koroneri, masalah di dalam saluran-saluran darah jantung. Saya akan jelaskan lagi sebentar lagi. Tetapi ada juga disebabkan oleh penyakit genetik dan ada juga disebabkan oleh benda-benda yang lebih pelik. Radang dalam badan. Infection macam COVID kan? Di mana ramai orang yang kena uh, COVID, myocarditis, ada juga yang tiba-tiba mati. Begitu je cerita dia. Dan walaupun kita telah menengah, menengah, menengahkan pelbagai polisi kerajaan untuk membantras dan mengurangkan risiko dan beban penyakit jantung, polisi untuk screening, strategi untuk memastikan pesakit ambil ubat, polisi untuk tidak merokok dan sebagainya yang boleh didapati di website KKM, beban penyakit jantung tidak berkurangan. Slide ini saya ambil daripada rakan saya, Dr. Faisal. Pada beberapa minggu lepas, kita telah mengadakan satu conference di KL. Faisal minta istero online. Saya dan juga Alan Fong, iaitu Presiden National Heart Association yang diwakili oleh Mr. Sanichi berada di sini berada dalam conference tu dan kami sibuk membincangkan mengenai beban penyakit jantung. Saya sini diadakan secara live di Facebook bersama dengan bernama radio. Dan kita pernah juga, saya pernah juga meneliti paras kolesterol. Sebenarnya intervensi-intervensi yang dilakukan oleh kerajaan, oleh negara, oleh negara-negara lain ada faedah dia. Kalau kita lihat mereka-mereka yang kena serangan sakit jantung, those who are coming in with a heart attack, memang boleh nampak kolesterol dia adalah lebih rendah daripada mereka yang tak makan ubat, for example. Maksudnya, orang yang berisiko mendapat ubat dan mereka ni mempunyai paras kolesterol yang lebih rendah daripada sebelumnya. Therefore, beban serangan sakit jantung tu sebenarnya adalah lower. Kalau dilihat daripada segi population level, daripada Malaysia, beban risiko penyakit jantung ni seperti merokok, darah tinggi, kolesterol, diabetes semakin menaik. One in five have diabetes. Okay, and that is a problem. It's not cheap. Berlaku pengarah hospital, saya tengok kos-kos ubat diabetes, jantung, ya Prof. Rana, tinggi. Mereka prescribe, saya kena counter sign. Berjuta. Kepada impact dia kepada, keraj- kepada kerajaan, berbilion. Kalau dilihat, the burden of healthcare financing, ya, Indirect cost maksudnya, you kena sakit jantung, you tak boleh kerja, betul? Minta MC, kadang-kadang sebulan, kadang-kadang enam bulan. You lepas bypass, you tak boleh kerja, tiga bulan, betul? Kan? Kadang-kadang six months, kena buat kadang rehab. You kena lemah jantung, dah tak boleh kerja lagi dah, tak mampu, minta pencen nilat. That's loss of economic income, loss of productivity. Sama ada you mati, langsung lah tak boleh kerja, meninggalkan anak-anak kecil, atau you tak boleh datang kerja. Those are all indirect cost. Direct cost daripada segi kemasukan dalam hospital pun tinggi, berbilion-bilion. Dan disebabkan oleh kos yang ketirisan kos yang sangat tinggi inilah lahirlah health white paper yang kita tengah tunggu-tunggu sekarang ni. <laughs> Okey. Masalah aja daripada segi polisi untuk melaksanakan kepada seluruh negara memang susah. Saya dengan isteri saya, isteri saya Dr. Maslena berbaju hijau yang beranak kecil di situ. Dia kerja kat KKM NIH. 
Selalulah bergaduh bergaduh kat rumah. Ha, apa lagi KM tak nak buat ni? You tahu tak susah? Ha, apa lah tak buat macam ni? Ni 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 ni. Boring gila conversation kat rumah, carilah. <laughs> Tapi that's the reality. We are both fighting the same battle. We want to reduce death. We want people to live longer. We want people to live healthier. But it's impossible. It's challenging. It's very very difficult because of all the weaknesses you can see on the slide here. All the threats that you can see on the slide here. Kita nak ban smoking, tak dapat. Kita try to enforce the rule, reverse. Kita try to prevent people smoking in restaurants. People still smoke, don't tak kisah pun. They are not brought up the same way as other people. Japan can do it. In Ireland, in 20, 2005, smoking ban. The whole country, tak boleh sokok dalam bangunan tertutup. Semua orang comply. Two years later, saya selaku trainee jantung masa itu, tidur aman damai, tak payah dimas panggil masuk untuk membedah secara mengejut kes-kes serangan sakit jantung. Turun, jatuh. That is the benefit of a strong policy. But we don't have it. InsyaAllah. Saya tunjuk balik bangunan ni because this is where I first started in 2012. Tingkap ni saya dah cakap, di situ saya meninjau padang bola di KSKB bersama dengan Dr. Zubin. Di situ dia, dia ni momen bersejarah, bersejarah. Sebab kalau tak ada momen ni saya rasa saya tak join UITM. Saya akan join UKM. Zubin kata, lepas operate jantung kat sini, Sazli, kita boleh pergi turun bawah main bola. 12 tahun saya tak pernah sampai pada bola tu. Tengok kat tingkap je. Sampai sekarang, I am still sore. Anyway, 2012, lepas saya pergi ke facility cash lab di Sungai Buloh, pada bulan 1 tu, a week later, Datuk Khalid panggil untuk interview. Two weeks later, uh, saya dipanggil secara formal untuk interview di fakulti perubatan. Two weeks later, Cik Rizal, please take note. Two weeks, Datuk Mizan. Kita boleh panggil interview secara formal masa itu. Uh, dan sebulan lepas tu saya dapat surat tawaran. That was how serious UITM <laughs> at that point. Um, and I have a lot to be grateful for kepada arwah Datuk Khalid. Uh, kerana apabila saya join, saya tak kenal dia. And everybody cakap, are you sure you want to go to UITM? Arwah Datuk Khalid tu susah tau. Tak apalah, kita try. And dia cakap senang je. Sazli, uh, this is cardiology, you build it up. Dia kata, oh, okay, Datuk nak saya buat apa? You build it up. Very simple. Kan Datuk? That's why he said. Tapi saya tak tahu yang dia sebenarnya pandang saya daripada jauh, daripada tingkat sembilan tu. Tengok je, tengok statistik. Orang bisik-bisik. Um, tapi with a very strong team, with very strong nurses, capable nurses, motivated people, we were able to build from scratch tahun 2012. Kita start Cabbage dengan kehadiran Prof Zamrin and team pada 2013. Dan kita start Primary Angioplasty pada 2013 juga. And then from there on, we just grew. Sungai Buloh ni, dia agak unik. Dia ada existential issue. Um, hidup segan mati tak mau, macam itulah. Yang gelak tu orang Sungai Buloh sebenarnya. Dia punya pasal lagi tu pening. Kita dah wujudkan fakulti perubatan di Sungai Buloh. Kita wujudkan hospital yang KPT tak tahu, by the way. Kita tarik bajet daripada universiti. Universiti pun bengang. Kita operasikan pusat jantung dengan dengan niat nak menyelamatkan nyawa orang. Jadi universiti tak boleh shut down. <laughs> Banyak kita buat benda pelik-pelik. Tapi niat tu penting lah untuk membantu orang untuk mengelakkan orang sakit jantung. Kenapa? Sebab masa tu fakulti perubatan berada di Hostel Sungai Buloh dan Hostel Selayang. Ramai pesakit jantung yang masuk ke uh, fasiliti ber, ter, ber, uh, dua tu terpaksa dirujuk ke Hostel Sedang. Jauh. You all datang sini pun nak parking pun susah kan? Bayangkan you kena parking kat Sedang. Satu jam travel nak parking pun susah. Tapi alhamdulillah 10 tahun 11 tahun saya bersama fakulti perubatan banyak yang saya kecapi. Antaranya adalah clinical trial dan research di mana uh, pelbagai publication telah dilakukan secara bersama dalam jurnal-jurnal yang international. Uh, sebab ini professorial lecture, jadi saya kena masuklah uh, elemen-elemen akademik dan juga uh, penyelidikan di sini. Um, dan juga telah memberi pulangan uh, clinical trial yang agak besar kepada unit cardiology sebanyak 3.7 juta selama 11 tahun kebelakangan ini. Agak uh, dia tak naik, uh, dia tak naik. 
Dan bukan saja di situ, malah operasi klinikal yang telah dijalankan juga memberikan pulangan yang sangat besar. 60 juta dalam tempoh 11 tahun yang kebelakangan ini. Dan ia adalah penyumbang terbesar antara unit kardiologi dan kardiotorasik di Sungai Buloh itu kepada penjanaan kewangan di, unit, di Hospital Al-Sultan Abdullah ini. Jadi syabas dan terima kasih saya ucapkan kepada semua tim-tim Pusat Perkhidmatan Jantung di Sungai Buloh ini. Mereka memang wonderful. Lah. Masuk kerja pukul 3 pagi pun tak komplain. Masuk kerja pukul 8 pagi pun tak komplain. <laughs> Memang amazing. Susah nak dapat orang macam ni. Pada tahun 2016, apabila saya diminta menjadi pengarah hospital, agak pelik. Masa sebelum saya dilantik, ada pro tem committee yang diketuai oleh uh, Prof. Datuk Bakar. Dan juga ada juga Datuk Amin dalam tu. Dan saya diberi tanggungjawab portfolio, uh, Sazli, you can jaga hospital. Oh, okay. Mana hospital? Tak ada lagi. Oh, okay. Saya kena buat apa? Oh, you tengok layout, you interact dengan, uh, dengan end user. Ini Datuk Amin nyayat. Eh? Saya ulang balik, saya akan ajuk dia. You tengok layout ni, you interact dengan student senang. <laughs> Datuk Amin itu saja. Uh, thank you, Datuk. Uh, a bit more than that. <laughs> But Alhamdulillah, it was made very easy. Um, our first office dekat tingkat 6, that's me and Puan Rosalina, Rokli, Puan Nina. Um, FTE half of the time dengan saya, uh, half of the time dengan fakulti perubatan, banyak membantu. Dan antara tugasan-tugasan awal adalah untuk nombor satu, memastikan Hostel Al-Sultan Abdullah ni menepati hasrat visi dan misi UITM. That is number one. Pada peringkat awal, hostel ni dibina cantik tetapi dalamannya rojak. Jadi apabila kita tengok balik, kita revise layout tu dan kita guna alasan CCAP. Remember, saya pergi St. John's, ya, yeah? hospital uh, sekolah yang kreatif. Datuk Sri Najib ada kat situ dulu. So, kita turun, tengok layout, kita bagi tahu pada kontraktor dan uh, uh, TRI, kita cakap sebenarnya layout ni tak mematuhi CCAPs, tidak mematuhi tidak mematuhi syarat regulation. You kena tukar. Oh, ya ke? Kita kena tukar. Tak payah tukar. You kena tukar. Regulation kata kena tukar. So dia tukarlah. Patutnya tak payah tukar pun. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Because of that, a lot of what you see in front of you takes place. Uh, in terms of the design, the fit out, the layout. There are some hits and misses. Okay? Tak boleh dah dapat 100%. And for that, I have deep regrets. Tetapi, saya rasa rata-rata kita bolehlah berpuas hati dengan apa yang kita ada sekarang ni. Dengan Hostel Asul Tak Abdullah ni. Um, pada peringkat awal itu saya bersama dengan Prof Abdul Rahman Omar tanam pokok um, apa ni Willow Tree Willow Tree ini it has a very deep deep history 10000 tahun cerita sejarah pokok willow ni kenapa the bark of the willow tree menghasilkan satu komponen salicylic acid salicylic acid ni kalau orang-orang zaman Fir'aun dulu sebelum dia pergi perang dia ambil the bark of the tree dia letak kat poket dekat cawat kota dia dia letak kat situ cawat dia ya yeah? Dia pakai. Bila dia perang, dia bergaduh, dia luka, dia ambil the bug tu, dia akan gigit. Sebab ada acid, uh, salicylic acid. Which is aspirin. Which is painkiller. Which is the medicinal property of the willow tree. So, semasa pecah tanah, kita tanam tiga pokok willow tree. And tiga-tiga pokok tu dah besar dan berada di ta ta tapak konsesi. <laughs> dah terlalu besar, dah tak boleh transfer ke sini. But that is the starting point. Um, standing on top of the world. Pembinaan hospital ni tak bukanlah kerja saya seorang. No 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 no. Saya duduk atas bahu Datuk Amin, Datuk Bakar, Datuk Khalid, Datuk VC, Chairman, Menteri, all these people who have worked hard for UiTM untuk dapatkan hospital ni. Cerita je sangat panjanglah. Kalau you nak tahu, you boleh baca buku Tan Sri Ibrahim um, mengenai struggle untuk mendapatkan tanah ni untuk mewujudkan hospital ni di sini. Okay. This is the output. Tak boleh nak letak dalam index, tak ada ISI, tak ada impact factornya, tapi this is what you have. And this is an effort from all of you. From all of you. And for that I have to say thank you. Kerana memberikan kerjasama yang terbaik <laughs> untuk sampai ke sini. Um, kalau siapa-siapa yang rasa depressed dengan apa-apa yang tak puas hati itu boleh jumpa Dr. Faizah. Kita ada psychiatric ward juga. <laughs> okay. So, hospital construction took place in 2016. And then, it was due to complete in 2020. And then, COVID hit. And semasa COVID datang, kita pun pening kepala lah. Siapa nak jaga COVID ke Sungai Buloh? Siapa nak jaga COVID ke Muncak Alam? Kita boleh buka ke hospital Muncak Alam? Oh, masa itu sangat stressful. Um, 
kita cakap okey we have to take part in uh, menjaga pesakit yang datang daripada my apps for example uh, for this i have to mention a few key team players um, perubatan respiratory anesthesiology prof karis and team um, respiratory my staff nurses dekat sungai buloh masa tu where tanpa segan silu lah without dropping the baton at all kita cakap we have to convert 10 more ICU beds dekat tingkat 4. The next day siap. Kita cakap kita kena buka uh, ward 4 tingkat 4 tu, buka 10 katil, ambil all patient dengan high flow nasal cannula. The next day siap. Amazing. And then bila kita nak buka pusat vaksin dewan belian dekat bawah ni, that was something else. That was an experience that I will never forget. Because it was not just me, but the whole of university. Not just the whole of university, but the whole of the community. Sampai kementerian pun turun. Untuk menggerakkan inisiatif pusat pemberian vaksin. PPV Mega. Ya, kita sekecap up. Mega. <laughs> UITM. And from that uh, activity alone, we were able to vaccinate about 100,000. Not as much as Datuk Irmu Hizam di the World Trade Center KL. That is Megatron <laughs> level of pusat vaksin. But we aspire to be. And from that experience, we made many, many friends. Alhamdulillah. Now, the topic is heart disease, betul? And I've shown you how, despite all our policy, we've not been able to reduce heart disease, betul? And I've shown you how one of our UITM contribution, kita produce cardiology, kita produce researchers, kita produce cardiothoracic team, kita produce staff nurses yang berkemampuan, kita produce master student, tapi we're still not seeing a drop in cardiovascular disease, maybe too early, betul? What can reduce cardiovascular disease? Ni, COVID. <laughs> a microscopic virus that you cannot see. Took the whole country by surprise. Focus on this graph, bottom left. That is the number of heart attack. Semasa kita lockdown, tahun 2020 dulu. It actually dropped. This is the number of stents yang doktor-doktor jantung letak. It actually dropped. Ramai kardiologis yang dah ready nak terjun bangunan, especially in private. Loss of income. Tak boleh letak stats. <laughs> University tak kisahlah. It actually drop. Another evidence is that puasa di bulan Ramadan. Apa beli puasa, risiko untuk kena serangan sakit jantung pun turun. Siapa sendiri yang ada darah tinggi, kerja manis, tahu. Apabila dia di bulan puasa, blood pressure okey, tak kisah okok, gula terkawal. Eh? Kami di kecemasan pun tahu jumlah penyakit jantung pun turun. Kita boleh relax, boleh balik awal. Stand by untuk buka puasa. <laughs> that is the reality. Dua intervention, sangat kuat. The rest doesn't really work. Why? Of Because of our attitude. Because of our upbringing, because of our... The way... I think it's our school. I have to be careful. My mother-in-law is here, Dr. Masna Halimunda. Dia dulu, dulu mantan ketua pengarah bagian pendidikan. Technology. <laughs> so she was a lady boss. And when you have a lady boss as a mother-in-law, you know who's the boss at home. It's not me. <laughs> okay, some of the achievement dekat Hassan ni, ada pelbagai lah, okay? And the proudest of it all was our auditorium next door, last year, 23 July, perasmian yang Pertuan Agong, tak pernah, saya rasa tak pernah lagi dalam sejarah UITM, di mana dua duli, duli yang maha mulia, uh, Banginda yang di Pertuan Agong dan juga uh, Sultan Selangor dan Permaisuri turun untuk merasmikan hospital um, sangat bersejarah kita juga telah menggerakkan operasi-operasi klinikal right now we are at almost 200 bed di Hassan ni we are at about 60 bed di Sungai Buloh Sungai Buloh ada cabaran di sini tapi insyaAllah by the end of next year or early 2025 we will try and achieve full capacity which is 400 beds Okay, insyaAllah. Tapi, the journey in Hassa has been really something else, I have to say. We started small dengan klinik-klinik, and then kita buka pengimantan pesakit dalam, and then kita buka daycare, and then kita buka OT, and then kita buka ICU, and then lastly, kita buka kecemasan. <laughs> we leave the disaster till last. Because kecemasan ni, resource dia lain macam. It requires, it's a mini hospital, it cannot shut down, 24-7. Yeah? So, therefore, we really had to plan. And, for all of those yang kerja dalam Hassan ni, you all tahu betapa kita suka planning. Tapi kadang-kadang, shocks 
hit our system. Shock ni benda yang kita tak boleh perasan. For example, COVID is a massive shock. Kita kena serangan kulat di Sungai Buloh baru-baru ni. That's a massive shock. Benda-benda yang kita tak dapat agak nak berlaku. Those are shocks. What determines and what defines us as doctors, as healthcare providers, macam mana kita negotiate those shocks. So it's very easy. Sebab saya cakap, kita dah lulus COVID, lulus lah. And we, I think we handle it well. Dengan Sungai Buloh, dengan Dewan Belian, dengan hospital, dengan kerjasama, dengan KKM, dengan universiti lain dan sebagainya. We handle it very, very well. Alhamdulillah. And we got away lightly. My wife would beg to differ, but from a university point of view, I think we did very well. <laughs> um, and those are some of our challenges dalam hospital ni. Right now, we are moving towards MSQH untuk menjadi dapat benchmark. Kita nak jadi macam abang kita di UKM. Because we need quality care. I am part of the problem. I'll tell you why. Masa saya join 2012 dulu, sewaktu tu kita tak ada regulatory, tak ada framework, tak ada apa. Ingat eh, Dato' Khalid cakap kepada saya, you build cardiology. Very simple. How? I don't care. Who? Up to you. You build cardiology. I'll watch you, but you build cardiology. So it's up to me. Network, cari kawan, cari seteru, cari member dan sebagainya. When we do things that way, without framework, sometimes bad things happen. Niat tu penting, kita nak bantu orang. Tapi kadang-kadang, we cannot see things that we don't know. The fourth quadrant. There are always things that we don't know. We don't know that we don't know. Even worse. <laughs> being part of the problem, being part of the culture, bila kita masuk ke hasa, kita nak ubah. And that's why all of you will know that we will be going for our MSQH accreditation. InsyaAllah, Pudan 11 ni. And then pray for our success. Because that will be the stepping stone for Hassa to go to the next level, insyaAllah. Okay, saya nampak orang semua dah tidur, saya akan cepat sikit. This is our strategic blueprint, kita dah mapkan kepada universiti. Dalam Hassa, we want to be the best, we have our mission and vision. Our vision is to be the premier academic centre. We have four mission uh, to lead in terms of healthcare service, in terms of research, in terms of um, teaching, and also in terms of healthcare financing. Saya rasa universiti hospital lain tak ada pun healthcare financing, tapi we put it as our mission. Yeah, that is part of our mission. And we have all these strategic trusts that will guide us to that mission. Thank you, Prof. Raya, for helping um, with these slides. Prof. Raya is head of our network linkages. And she helped me with all these slides. And there's a lot of other product in our pipeline. Not only are we producing, providing clinical service, but we also save the government 100 juta from our own IT center yang kita develop. We will be among the three uh, centers in the country yang akan ada phase one clinical trial lab with our BE center di Sungai Buloh. Um, kita ada projek bersama Pfizer dan juga Majlis Pembangunan Kuala Sangu untuk melakukan health screening secara berkala on a monthly basis, part of our research activity. We have launched our full paying patient, the first university hospital to do so, where we will generate more revenue, inshallah. And also we have started providing health screening to our staff and patient. Where do we go from there? As a hospital provider, is the next step untuk membesar lagi. So kita dah propose another 600 bed untuk hospital Asultan Ullah di tanah sebelah ni, 18 ika. We have proposed a science park and also faculty of medicine dekat belakang ni, insyaAllah. We also have proposed a community centre di pintu satu di puncak alam ni untuk mengurangkan beban kepada pesakit-pesakit. Bila orang datang hospital, mereka tak nak datang hospital pun. We should avoid people coming to hospital. They should really go to their primary community carer. Sebab bila datang hospital ni mahal. Lagi-lagi kat sini kita charge, lagi lah mahal. So it's not a good idea. So we try to decongest the hospital. And we hope to be the catalyst of what we call the medical city that will attract Innovation, that's number one. And this is what I ask from all my staff on a weekly. Tiap-tiap bulan kita buat penghimpunan bulanan. Tiap-tiap bulan kita cakap benda sama. Kita akan promote research. Kita akan promote innovation. Kita akan promote benda-benda baru. Because why? Dia akan generate visibility, yeah, trust dan juga ekonomi. Now we are collaborating dengan ramai syarikat kat luar. Pfizer, Farmaniaga, all the local, international, Philips. So that industrial training boleh dilakukan. Research boleh dilakukan, innovative idea boleh transfer, commercialization can be faster. So all these things are taking place in the background as we speak. 
Because we need to go further. Hospital je tak cukup. Beban penyakit jantung tu masih tinggi. And we have identified our strategy. We have three steps. Kita akan pelopori digital health. Our second step, natural compound. Kita akan kerjasama untuk tanam cili, organic cili for example. And then hopefully kita boleh capai hasrat yang di Pertuan Agong tahun lepas. Itu untuk melahirkan ubat-ubatan dan vaksin sendiri. Which is challenging. Okay. With that, I shall give you two minutes to enjoy this next slide. human beings, particularly to know about myself. You know, what makes the world to move forward is knowledge and application of knowledge. And so we are at that leading edge to, to steer the community, uh, individuals, the country forward. I think those are the things which uh, inspire me to do medicine, and to choose higher education as my choice in terms of profession and cardiology. You cannot get through life just on your own. Impossible. You need to work with people, you need to have mentors, you need to have friends. You don't have to invent the wheel yourself each and every time. Work with brilliant people. Team up or get into teams within or outside the country.
Kita sedekahkan Al-Fatihah. Okay, now comes the second part. Instead of being a professor, a director of a hospital, I'm now a clinician. This is Dr. Sazli, and this is what we are going to talk about, heart disease. Heart disease kills. Sometimes it takes people away, your loved ones from you, dramatically, suddenly. Sometimes you're waiting, and it just happens. Here, thank you to Dr. Hanis, two of his friends, almost 36. 36 year old, healthy people, playing football, one waiting for his wife in the car, found dead, leaving small children. We've heard of celebrities, Asha Sinclair, uh, taking a nap after a shower, and then found by his wife, tak bangun tidur. Bob Lokman is a patient of ours, patient of Zubin and myself. We look after him for many, many years. He's got heart failure, and one day, he just passed away at home. He had a very weak heart. Bottom left is my neighbor, who I look after. I'm very young. She came to see me two years ago. She's actually part of my book. And thank you to my neighbors for allowing me to use a picture where she suffered from heart failure after pregnancy, what we call postpartum cardiomyopathy. Despite medicine, one day I received a phone call at 3 o'clock in the afternoon saying, Rina, so I came back from hospital, I went into the house, and she was there on the landing. She was already cold. Her downtime was more than 30 minutes. The ambulance came, they asked me if I wanted to resuscitate, I said there's no point. I know her history, I know she has a very weak heart. And her son, who was two at that point, was sitting at the corner crying. This is the saddest. That's my cousin. His parents are here. And one day while well, I was in <coughs> Panko, I received a phone call saying, after Asa, he prayed and he just didn't wake up. And he's such a good boy. And he died in his sleep. Just like that. Very sad. Sudden cardiac death is no joke. It's underappreciated. We don't understand it. We don't know who can get it. We have very, very poor framework here in Malaysia. When I was in Dublin, I trained in Tala for about a year with a mentor who was screening young people with cardiac death, family. We were doing, drawing family trees for three, four generations, trying to look for a mutant gene that can increase your risk of dying suddenly. There's a lot of disease we know of that is hereditary, genetically driven, that can cause sudden cardiac death. And these are the ones that attacks people who are younger than 35. Above the age of 35, most of the time, the causes of cardiac death, whether it's sudden, whether it's a heart attack, is going to be from what we call atherosclerosis. In my CV, you know that I'm the chairman, I was a past chairman for Malaysian Society of Atherosclerosis, which is part of NHEM, where we try to address and raise awareness to people to get their cholesterol reduced. The strongest intervention that we have, which is very straightforward, Fire and forget is to use a drug called statin, which reduces your cholesterol. Fire and forget. That's one risk factor that you can control. There are 12 more. There's 11 more. And some of those are impossible to control. For example, air pollution, noise, poor sleep, stress. These are the things that you cannot control. Impossible. With cholesterol, you can. Blood pressure, technically you can. But sometimes you forget your medicine. You forget it for one day, your blood pressure surges. It's that quick. Cholesterol medicine is slightly different. Diabetes, 
Technically, you can. But let's face the facts. You're in Malaysia. You have nasi lemak, roti cana, teh tarik, kopi tarik. All of us are exposed to those things. If you have diabetes, dietary intervention is nearly impossible. These are my friends. Rob Bird, Ola Constant, 2008. I call them my friends because when they published this paper, I was part of it, but they never mentioned my name. Not so much friends. Lah. <laughs> but we look at the incident of sudden cardiac death in Ireland, and we found that the majority are due to coronary disease. Some are caused by other things like genetically driven thickened heart muscle, inflammation, short circuiting of your electrical system of the heart. Those things can cause sudden cardiac death too. When you talk about cardiac death, the majority would happen above the age of 35. That's when the graph starts to spike very, very quickly. There's some in the very, very young group. Cardiac death, yeah? And in the very young, it's usually due to congenital. Babies are born with holes in the heart, vessels that's overlapping sideways and chances of survival is going to be very low. In the elderly above the age of 35, most of the time it's because of atherosclerosis. If you want to talk about wellness, that's what you have to address. How do you achieve and reduce the burden of atherosclerosis? Remember, atherosclerosis, what it means is that those cholesterol that you eat from your food, most of the time, if you're healthy, it'll do nothing. It's absorbed by your gut, it goes to your liver, it is excreted back into your gut, it goes out in your poo. Okay? The fat that you eat will go out in your poo. Some of it converted for healing, some of it converted to cure dead cells and stuff like that. But most of it is excreted. But if you have inflammation, what is inflammation? Radang. Tahu radang? You jatuh, tangannya merah, luka, merah lah dia. Radang, di bahagian kulit. The same process happens inside the body. You start rokok. Those toxins causes radang to the blood vessel. You stress. Your stress level releases a lot of stress hormones that causes radang to the blood vessel. In patches, not all at the same time. Tak cukup tidur, sama. Terlebih berat badan, sama. Obesity leads to inflammation. Diabetes, sama. Can you control these things? No. Impossible. How can you reduce it? Eat healthy. Makan sayur je lah. Tak boleh makan nasi lemak. Is that good enough? Can you survive it? Jangan minum teh tarik. Huu, cabar lah. <laughs> Exercise setiap hari. I try to. It's not easy. Not easy. When the heart stops, it usually goes into this rhythm. What we call ventricular fibrillation. Okay? I have a nice video, but the video does not want to play. <laughs> I will describe to you. Top right hand corner is an ECG. You go to a doctor, complain chest pain, you get an ECG. Re usually it looks like that. The spikes are regular. When your heart decides to stop, the electricity in your heart fires in a chaotic manner, which is the ECG at the bottom, which is the picture at the bottom. So instead of contracting like this, your heart is now doing this. It's not pumping. You're not getting any blood into your brain. And if you read from my book, you start losing consciousness. When we operate in the cath lab, we're dealing with people's heart. We put up little balloons to open up the blood vessel. When the balloon goes up, blood does not flow down the artery. Meaning, your heart muscle is deprived of oxygen for a few seconds. We do that intentionally to open up the blood vessel. Sometimes, it doesn't go very well because we have to open up for a long time. Or, when the balloon goes up, it causes a lot of clots to travel down the artery. What happens then? The muscle is deprived of oxygen. Instead of pumping, it stops. Instead of getting blood to your brain, you're not getting blood to your brain. What happens next is exactly like this. The patient will check up. Pening lah kepala saya, doctor. Ringan kepala lah, doctor. And then tiba-tiba, mata dia will start rolling backward. They'll start having a seizure. They'll do this. And if we don't intervene there and then to raise up the blood pressure to return cardiac output, patient will surely die. 
that's what we face in the cath lab. Those three boys sitting there, the cardiologists, hello. Those are the things that they have to be wary of when they do the procedures. That's the risk that we take when we deal with these things. I tell you this, why? Because the majority of you, men, <laughs> unfortunately take it too easy. When, we have, when you are in my shoe, having to deal with scenarios like that, from very, very young people, age 30, age 40, age 20, with a heart attack, and you know that they are this close to death, that can be avoided if they look after themselves. You don't want to wish that on anyone. Okay? So that's ventricular fibrillation. These are some pictures of atherosclerosis, where this is the main blood vessel. You have all this gunk, lemak lemak ni, dekat aorta. What it causes is it causes the narrowing of saludara dekat kaki. Sometimes it can cause narrowing of saludara dekat otak, menyebabkan stroke. Ini gambar aneurysm. This is your main blood vessel dekat perut, aorta. Dia turun macam ni, dia pecah dua, kiri dan kanan. And bahagian ni bengkak. My dad had an aortic aneurysm. It actually leaked in 2016. He nearly died. Alhamdulillah, he survived through a miraculous operation. But he was diagnosed with undiagnosed hypertension. Anak dia doktor. Dua orang pula tu, saya dengan abang ipar saya, dua-dua tak tahu dia ada, ada high blood pressure. But that's part of the reason why he had the aneurysm. He survived, Alhamdulillah. Um, I'm very big into atherosclerosis and inflammation. I talk about it all the time. This was a couple of weeks ago where we gave a lecture at KL. And I will bore you with this process because you need to know. What will happen bila you dah makan lemak-lemak tu is that diserap dalam hati, lebih hantu masuk dalam salur darah, LDL cholesterol, your bad cholesterol itself, most of the time, kalau you healthy, tak ada radang, tak ada masalah. Tapi kalau salur darah tu ada radang, because of hisap rokok, stress, tak cukup tidur, diabetes, obesity dan sebagainya, it starts to attract all this bad cholesterol to stick to the blood vessel. And that's the problem. This is why you have this process. That bad cholesterol will start to go into the surface and it is eaten up by one of the cells. It becomes a foam cell, a macrophage. It builds up, it builds up and builds up and builds up. Lama-lama, salur darah tu sumbat. And the process carries on. And you have various different stages of, of atherosclerosis. Daripada normal, when you are in, uh, in, in the womb. And when you are born, immediately, atherosclerosis process starts taking place. And the ones that gets to our attention in the cath lab or cardiology service are usually like this. Kalau dah macam ni, kadang-kadang terus hantar kepada Prof. Dr. Rajamin brain for bypass. Then there's not much we can do. This slide is to show you that the burden of heart disease have not dropped for the past 20 years. Okay? You have various types of heart attack, either STEMI, either non-STEMI, just in case you want to know. This is an example of what we do. Bila orang sakit dada, sakit jantung, kita akan buat ECG. So, for anyone yang kena siapa-siapa sakit dada, terus pergi jumpa doktor, buat ECG cepat mungkin. Why? Because you want to pick up certain patterns like this ST elevation, ST elevation, ST elevation dekat sini. And what it shows is that daripada ECG ni kita dah boleh agak sumbat dekat belah kanan ke, bagian depan ke, bagian belakang ke. Yeah? And bila kita dah buat angiogram, kita terus boleh tahu. Bila you sakit jantung, bila you jumpa saya, saya nak buat angiogram you secepat mungkin. Sebab kalau ada sumbat, saya nak buka secepat mungkin. Sebab apa? Sebab lagi cepat saya buka, lagi lalu saya boleh return oksigen kepada otot-otot tu, lagi selamat, lagi lama yang boleh hidup. Kerosakan pada jantung tu akan jadi sangat kecil. That's what we want. Sometimes kita capai, sometimes kita capai. Okay, here's a scenario. Orang ni kena sakit jantung, darah mengalir tapi slow. Okay, next picture, kita dah letak stand. You boleh nampak stand kat sini. Kita dah sedut all this clot dalam salur darah je. Kita dah letak stand kat sini, tiba-tiba lepas tu salur darah je mengalir lancar. Nampak kan? This is an angiogram. This is what happens when you have a heart attack. You have a blocked artery, you have an open artery. Very simple. Okay, this guy nearly died. But he did. Remember, 50% of people yang kena heart attack will not make it. 50%. A lot of the time yang datang hospital tu, they will have a mortality rate of between 10 to 20%, depending. A lot of them would actually succumb to sudden cardiac death. Yang tiba-tiba mati mengejut kat rumah, tak bangun tu semua tu, chances are, it's a heart attack. Especially early in the morning. Why? Early in the morning, about 4 o'clock in the morning, your body releases a lot of cortisol. And with this cortisol, your blood pressure goes up, your heart rate goes up, your body gets ready for your body is trying to get ready to get ready for the day but that is when radang can sometimes become unstable you have a plaque rupture okay can you reverse 
atherosclerosis? The answer is yes. You can use medications such as statin, where after many, many years, this is a study, not by us, but sometimes we see this when we do our intravascular ultrasound. After many, many years of being on a statin therapy where your LDL is really, really low, ideally less than 1.4, you can get plaque regression. Why? All these plaques, all this cholesterol, oh dear, tolong, all the cholesterol that is sticking to the artery, the body tries to heal by either taking it out back into the blood vessel in the lumen itself or by absorbing into the vasa vasorum, which is the little, little blood vessel that supplies nutrient to the coronary arteries. So that process takes place all the time. Okay? So with intense statin therapy, you can see that in patients with high-risk plaque, when they go on statin therapy, the plaque volume actually improves. You can open up your blood vessel. You must avoid inflammation. You must avoid triggers for atherosclerosis in the first place for that to happen. Okay? I show you this slide because this is new knowledge to me. We focus on bad cholesterol, which is LDL. So, alan saya selalu, patient diabetes, LDL je rendah. Tapi bila masuk dalam mak jantung, selalu darah je semua halus. Daripada perut, ke otak, ke kaki, semua halus. Kenapa? Because of this. LDL ni, molekul yang memerlukan inflammation untuk masuk ke dalam selalu darah. Remnant cholesterol, which is everything else apart from LDL and good cholesterol, your triglyceride dan sebagainya, actually tak perlu inflammation nak masuk dalam selalu darah. Dia akan pass through sesuka hati dia. And that is part of the mechanism why diabetics get diffuse coronary disease. Therefore, we have to refer them to our surgeon. Because if we were to put in stand, it's not just one. It's actually 10 or 12 stands, which is very unhealthy. Very expensive. One stand is 5,000. 10 stand is 50,000. Kalau you buat kat private, 500,000. Baik hantar bypass. So that's important. Statins can help reduce your LDL and also reduce your uh, triglyceride. Sometimes, when I talk about sudden cardiac death and risk of cardiac death, we know, as I said earlier on, ada masalah-masalah genetik je yang boleh menyebabkan short circuit kepada jantung. Ada masalah-masalah yang boleh menyebabkan jantung itu tebal. Ada juga kadang-kadang dia kena infection atau inflammation, myocarditis for example. Here's an example of a case that we did. We published this. Very young fella, 25 year old. 25 tahun. Bapak dia meninggal umur 49, sakit jantung. Tiba-tiba masuk dengan sakit jantung, sakit dada. Kita bawa masuk dalam makmal, terus buat angiogram dia, nampak ada selalu darah yang sangat sempit kat bagian depan. This is called a widow maker. Pembunuh utama orang-orang lelaki. Especially mereka yang isap rokok. Dia tak isap rokok, budak ni. 25 tahun tak isap rokok. Why do we call them a widow maker? Because it affects the very top of your blood vessel. Ini macam kalau kiranya empangan kelanggit tu tak ada air, maka satu lembah kelang tak ada air. Sumpah dia kat situ. <laughs> yeah? So, he was safe, we couldn't stand. But what we found was that his cholesterol was super high, 12. Dia punya bad cholesterol. You all punya bad cholesterol is probably between 2 or 4. Okay? Maka ubat statin, reduce by 50%. Bila 12, you makan ubat sahaja, mungkin tak mencukupi. Therefore, we were very lucky. I showed you earlier on that we do a lot of clinical trials. At that point in time, we were doing clinical trial on a new drug, a monoclonal antibody, which you inject into your tummy every month. And that drug is super powerful. It can reduce your cholesterol by up to 90%. When we were screening patients, recruiting patients, even one patient cakap to me, eh, baguslah ubat ni, doktor. Kenapa? Oh, saya punya sex life bagus. Oh. <laughs> Tiba-tiba rambut saya tumbuh. Oh, okay. Ini semua side effect ubat lah. <laughs> Positive side effect. They liked it. But because of financial reason, we were only able to give that particular medicine to the boy for about six months. After that, it stopped. But what we found was that even giving and lowering cholesterol by using those injectables for a short duration, we were able to reduce that level for up to one year when we followed him up just by taking oral tablets alone. So he's still doing very, very well. This is not a nice scenario. So, this man was watching TV with his father and suddenly did what I, ex what I showed to you just now. His brother was a nurse, performed CPR straight away, and he was resuscitated for 40 minutes. 
And then he came to us along the way because we had to do his angiogram. Initially, ECG was normal. Later on, we found that he has an abnormality in the ECG, which can lead to sudden short circuit of the artery, and he was diagnosed with Brugada syndrome. And for this genetically inheritable condition that causes short circuit electrical conduction in your artery, in, uh, in your blood, in your muscle, in your heart, we have to utilize a battery called a ICD. Expensive, also expensive, about sixty thousand ringgit. So heart disease is never cheap. That's part of the problem. There is also other genetically inheritable condition, like this arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, which I bring out here because we had an interesting case. This boy was suspected of a heart attack, collapse. Bila datang kat kami, ECG dia tak adalah apa-apa sangat. Buat angiogram, nampak arteri dia normal. Kenapa ni? Kenapa tiba-tiba dia pengsan? Sekali bila tanya history, and this is the importance of taking a medical history, 10 tahun lepas, abang dia pun meninggal cara yang sama. Yeah? Luckily, ada post-mortem masa tu. And then bila kita tengok balik, rupa-rupanya abang dia ada masalah genetik pada jantung, bernama ARBC, diagnosed on biopsy. And we had to implant another battery into him to prevent him from collapsing again from ARBC. Okay. Right. So what have we learned so far? Heart disease kills. There's two main types of heart disease. The one is caused by atherosclerosis and the one that causes death in young people, which can be due to genetic, can be due to an electrical problem, can be due to a muscle problem, can be due to a valve problem, can be due to inflammation, radang. Despite all that we have done, we have not been able to reduce heart disease, except for COVID. And I don't think anybody here wants COVID back again, correct? <laughs> you do. <laughs> so, the next part of my lecture is going to be on what we as a group have been trying to do to try and reduce uh, this, this problem. So we need to be disruptive. Usual business as usual in terms of trying to fix this system will probably not work. We know that we have risk costs that was driven, uh, derived from America, for example, that probably under or overestimate our risk. We know that we do ECGs in patients that we suspect of heart disease, probably too late. They don't have the masalah too. We know that trying to get them examined by doctors, sometimes they don't come to doctors. We know that ideally everybody gets an ultrasound to the heart to see the valves and to see the heart muscle. That's not easy to do because of excess. So all these things are challenges. But if we can combine them all into one system, then we have the ideal solution, which is this little handheld device or a tricorder, like a Star Trek. You pergi dekat orang sakit, tak payah pakai stethoscope lagi dah. You letak je tricorder. Terut, 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 ting. Ah, dah dapat diagnosis. That would be ideal. Can it be done? That's what we're trying to do. So I'm stupid enough to try and venture into these things. <laughs> My wife told me this morning, some of the things that we do, it's not because we... Because it's not because it was easy. We do it because initially we thought it was easy. <laughs> and then when we actually start doing it, it's actually very, very hard. Yeah? Um, in 2015, we had, I had a PhD student who started dissecting into our registry. We contribute to the National Cardiovascular Database Registry that's maintained by Mr. Sanichi here. Um, and so far, it has enrolled 140,000 patients with heart attack across the country from these 26 different hospitals. So we access that data because we want to try and predict and see. We want to figure out what are the characteristics of people yang mati awal, mati mengejut, uh, and so on and so forth. So we have developed our AI database, predictive solution. We call it many, many things. My heart risk, my heart ACS, my heart air, my heart BP, my heart echo, my cardiac rehab, dan sebagainya. You can find it on our website, which, which is live, to predict cardiovascular risk and sudden death. Our data source ni is big data. Tapi my wife would only laugh at this. I deal with 120, 130,000 people. Her analysis is 30 million people. <laughs> two, 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 two. <laughs> 30 million versus 140,000 is like chiput, but that's what it is. I share you a video of some of our output. The ideal scenario is that we can predict your heart disease before it happens. The ideal scenario is that we can pick out patients who are very at, uh, who are at very high risk, especially if they're in kampong, out of state, 
rural, so that they can be transferred to a tertiary level or to a super hospital faster. That's the ideal state. We have risk calculator, but we don't take it seriously because we don't believe in it and our resources are very, very limited. So what we have tried to develop is we have tried to develop a system that can refine your prediction so that it's more accurate. And we have shown that our solution is more accurate than what we currently use. We're able to improve prediction by 30 to 40%. Uh, this is an example of prediction of heart attack, my ACS. Um, where using machine learning and AI-based algorithm, we're able to reclassify patients into either high risk or low risk so that they can be looked after better between 20 to 50%. So that's quite big, quite a big amount. Um, we received a grant from Mosti a couple of years ago to look at the impact of air pollution and cardiac death. Again, we have a large database from all people with heart attacks. We marry that database with data from air pollution for the past 10 years, and we try to figure out if you come in with a heart attack, for example, what's your risk tomorrow of dying when the air pollution hits 200? Or we try to figure out if you have a heart attack tomorrow and the air pollution is 100, but you live in Kuala Lumpur where you have a lot of uh, other air pollution and stress environment, etc., etc. What is your risk of getting a heart attack at that point? This is an evolving field that we are going to try and explore a bit more. I will work with air pollution, because air pollution kills, yeah? And it's, it's, it's very difficult to avoid. Um, and as I said to you, you have 12 risk factors to look after. The one that is blue, you can deal with, because that's behavioral, alcohol, smoking, low physical activity, what you eat. The one that is in red is because you are not looking after yourself, and there's probably some genetic reason to develop disease. The one that is in green, susah. You cannot change the environment. It's very hard for you to change whether the sun being very, very hot or very, very cold. It's very, very challenging. So air pollution is there. It's high up there. So what we've done is that when we marry the two data together, we found that using machine learning and root mean square error, we were able to predict individuals that have a higher risk of death when the air is dirty, or when they're in the wrong location for some reason. Um, these are some of our results. You can read this in our paper. Lah. I will not bore you because a lot of these things are very, very technical. So that's in patients with heart attack. Who are going to die sooner? What about in normal people like yourself without any disease at all? Part of our problem is that a lot of our risk scores, a lot of our risk scores are developed from Western countries, from America, from UK, from US. They are not from Malaysia at all. How can you take this Mark Saleh, six foot seven, yeah, mata biru, kulit putih, makan sausage and hot dog, yeah, and say that his risk is sama macam you? Tak boleh. <laughs> Chances are you will misestimate your risk. And that is why what we did, we did what we do. And we do what we did. Um, 2017, Anissa Fura is part of this um, guideline. They recognize that in Malaysia, we don't have, we have not developed our own calculator. So, and this risk calculator ni, dia macam beranak-ranak tau. Every country uses different one and they are always producing better and better and they are always trying to get you to do better. Negara menjajah kan? Huh? Europeans will say, use ours. American will say, use ours instead. Australia will come up to you and say, ours is better. So we said, nah lah, let's develop our own and see whether it is truly better. So that's what we did. We validated against all these risk costs. So we found that some risk costs actually perform very, very well in Malaysia. And then we apply what we have been doing before this. We apply a bit of AI and try to figure out what are the variables, predictors that could actually predict risk in healthy people. And our solution is slightly better than <laughs> Framingham, unfortunately. Only slightly better by 4 to 5%. Not that great because Framingham itself is actually very, very good formulation. Uh, where our NRI is uh, about 15%. Still pushing the boundary of knowledge. Now you know. Um, and from this, we have developed an online system um, that people could actually log on to, and we have inter interactive databases, um, interfaces, and so on, so that layperson can know their risks, doctors can know their patients' risks, and also um, help people understand better. We will evolve this project so that it will be more useful, uh, more commercializable, obviously, but more useful to the lay people and to patients alike, inshallah. It's live. Our next step, and this is where Shawal, you have done some work into this, is to try and estimate blood pressure using all the data that we have. Because remember, if you have high blood pressure, 
It's probably one of the risk factors that is very, very difficult to control. You think your blood pressure is controlled, but when you actually check during the course of the day, it might not be very, very well controlled, despite taking medicine. And that's part of the reason why a lot of people are still suffering from sudden stroke, sudden heart attack, collapsing dead, and so on and so forth. They think they have high blood pressure, they take medicine, they think they're under control, but they're not. And that's part of the problem. So my heart BP is our work that will try and identify continuous blood pressure reading from your watch or wearable so that you will know your numbers at all times. Uh, another work that we are doing is using ultrasound, which is called MyEcho. And this is great. And this is probably the best thing that I have to offer you when you come to see me from a diagnostic point of view. Dulu, bila jumpa doktor, doktor salam, borak, tanya history, letak stethoscope, dengar-dengar, bagi ubat. Kalau jumpa kardiologis, kita tak guna stethoscope sangat dah. Kita terus guna echo. <laughs> Ambil ultrasound, letak kat dada, and we visualize the heart directly. So that we can see... Oh, tukar slide, tukar tukar. So that we can see the structure, we can see the valve, we can see whether or not the heart is functioning normally or not. And that's very, very important because then we can give you the right advice. A lot of the time, in rural especially, where you have rheumatic heart disease and sebagainya, they are not diagnosed early enough, they are not referred early enough, the intervention is not done early enough, and that leads to a lot of the late presentations that we see. Okay? Some of the things that we have been doing, uh, we've been publishing, has been recognised. There's no point trying to predict something without provi providing a solution, correct? And hospitals are scarce. So the one thing I learned from my master's in LSE is you need to democratise, Healthcare. You need to disrupt healthcare. So we need to deliver point of care, bukan pada doctor, bukan pada nurses, bukan pada clinic, kepada patient. Individuals should be more empowered to have the knowledge, the right diagnostic tool, so that they can look after themselves better. One of my pain points is with patients after a heart attack. They come in with a heart attack. I see them in clinic, I shake their hand, give them medicine, I give them advice, they go home, Six months later, they come back with a heart attack. Why? They did not stop smoking. I'm too busy to tell them to smoke. I have a smoking program. They have a lot of people that they have to look after. They give advice. It's not effective. We try to be effective, but we're not. So this is our solution. Uh, not that... Ah, it doesn't play. I'm sorry. But what my cadet rehab is, is an app solution that our patients will hopefully in the future download and use it as a guide, as a coach, as a health coach, as a life coach, as an exercise coach, so that they can recover in a safer environment, health, have people at the background to prompt them, to guide them, to help them along the way, giving them advice on medicine, on lifestyle, on diet, on sleep, etc. Et That's pretty much it. That's my kind of rehab. And this is the work in progress that we are trying to do, because if we get this right, and then the next phase is actually to deliver the solution for other type of diseases as well. And these are some of our researchers that we have been working with. Okay, I didn't realize I'm going to be talking this long. I'm so, so sorry. One of my hobbies is actually traveling. And I've traveled to many different countries, 46. I hope to increase it to more, but I don't think my kids will let me, unfortunately. And from my grandparents' house, my auntie is here, she still lives there. Rumah kampung kat Taman Ibu Kota. We moved to St. John's, we moved to Taiping. At some point, I was in Africa with Kunta Kinte and all these <laughs> African tribes, which is very good. And along the way, we've been to many, many places. Uh, leadership courses in Berlin, Anis Safura, you were there. Um, and the icing on the cake was actually to have the honour of officiating this hostel two years ago. So I've spoken for a long time. I'm not here on my own. You guys obviously play a huge, huge role. And therefore, I would like to dedicate this next um, videos to all of you, and I really hope it plays.
academic, academia, research, clinical and admin. We exchange those, ha those hats. Macam tadi lah. Yeah? Sometimes I'm chairing a meeting and then I'm in the OT. And then I'm talking to some visitors, menteri, etc. And then in the evening, I'll be looking at some PhD proposal and stuff like that. And we do this without even thinking twice about it. It's amazing. And all these professors in front of you here, they've been doing it a lot longer than I have. And I'm in awe. So, in conclusion, heart disease is all on you. you we have to look after ourselves better. Those 12 risk factors that I've shown you, there are things that you can do. We research into it a lot, we publish a lot, but it's not easy to change. The way forward is to do something more disruptive and more radical, more dramatic. And I really hope we can, we can really deliver this solution to improve the burden in the future. You always need cardiologists, you always need, you always need cardiothoracic surgeons, doctors, emergency physicians, rehab, and so on and so forth. But with a bit of AI, I hope the right people can get the right care. The right people will seek the right specialists and avoid premature death, obviously. So with that, I thank you for listening, for spending time, for spending your morning to listen to me chat yakada yakada for the past hour or so. Um, this has been truly an honor to be with you ITM, with all of you here in front of me. This journey is, um, has been quite amazing. What happens next, uh, there's probably there's no slides and pictures because even the projector system refused to show me what's going to happen despite spending time learning AI and prediction and whatnot, you know. I just cannot see the future. So with that, I thank you all again. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hello. Okay. Thank you very much, Prof, for the interesting lecture. Please remain on the stage. Now we would like to invite Professor Dr. Dr. Mizan Hitam, accompanied by Professor Dr. Nazrun Shuai, to proceed to the stage for a gift presentation to Professor Zazli. Thank you, Professor Dato. We would like to invite the VIPs to return to their seats for a photography session together with the audience.
Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our event today. Angiogram performed to visualize the artery. Rescue PCI is to open up the thrombus. Renowned physician internationally is an inspiring model to many of us. Now, we would like to invite the esteemed professors to proceed to the, the photography area outside of the audit auditorium. The professors first. Okay. Next, Next, we would like to... We would like to invite Dato Dr. Mizan, uh, uh, Professor Dr. Sazli, Professor Dr. Ahmad Nazrun, Professor Dato Dr. Ahmad Zubaidi, Professor Dr. Muhammad Zukifli, and Professor Dato Dr. Aminuddin Ahmad to to leave the auditorium and to join the photography session outside the auditorium. On that note, also we would like to invite everyone um, to, if you would like to leave the hall, um, <laughs> you'd like to leave the hall. <laughs> With that, we end our duty as master of ceremony for today's event. Wabillahi taufiq wal hidayah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. We guess the, the right of the guests will leave through the right sign side of the door of the auditorium. Thank you. Yes, that means. That means. That's it.